everyone. Let's start with segmenting words into individual sounds. M, A, F, chose, chose, ch, o, z, lunch, lunch, l, a, n, ch, cash, cash, k, a, sh, that, that, v, a, t, chill, chill, ch, i, o, brush, brush. B, r, a, sh. Great. Now I'm going to say a part, and then we're going to add a sound to the beginning to make a word. Say or. Or. Add f, and the word is four. four. I. I. Add w, and the word is y. In. In. Add ch, and the word is chin. Ed, ed, add sh, and the word is shed. shed. Ear, ear, add ch, and the word is cheer. Ear. Ick, ick, add f, and the word is thick. Red, red, add sh, and the word is shred. Now we're going to add an ending sound. So you repeat this part. Say car. Car. Add d to the end, and the word is card. Say nor. Nor. Add f to the end, and the word is north. Far. Far. Add m to the end, and the word is farm. farm. Snore. Snore. Add t to the end, and the word is snort. Char. Char. Add j to the end, and the word is charge. Sore. Sore. Add s to the end, and the word is source. Bar. Bar. Add n to the end, and the word is barn. barn. Now I am going to say a word broken into syllables. I'll be chopping it. All you need to do is listen. And say all the syllables together to blend it into the whole word. Here's our example: but ter fly, butterfly, disappearing, disappearing, in cred i bull, incredible, pill low. Case, pillowcase, some bod e, somebody, in ter est ing, interesting, a di shun, addition, d sim bur. December. Life saver. Life saver. Now for the final component. I am going to say a word. You repeat the word, and then you will use your chopping hands to break the word into syllables. This is a great strategy to use in your writing when you're trying to write a long word. Break it into parts and write each part as you go. Impossible. 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 Understanding. 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 Presenter. 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 Enjoyment. 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 Hibernate. 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 Popular. Popular. Pop. You. Lur. Furniture. 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 Elastic. 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 Great job, everyone.
we are going to use the routine read, spell, write, extend to practice our high frequency words today. First, we'll read. Today is a special day. This is the word special. What's the word? Special. Next, we spell. Since special is a longer word, I can scoop some of the letters to help me remember, like this. S-P-E-C-I-A-L, special. Spell it with me just like that. S-P-E-C-I-A-L, special. After we spell the word, it's time to write the word three times, like this. S-P-E-C-I-A-L. A L. Make sure you name the letters as you write them. And finally, we'll extend. Is the word special like any other words you know? Social and official have similar endings. Where would you put special on a word wall? Would you put it under the letter S? Or maybe you would put special under the blend SP. Now we'll use the word special in our own sentence and then try to write the sentence like this. This is my special toy. Use this routine to activate the sound, letter, and meaning parts of your brain to make high frequency words stick. Today's phonics lesson is about vowel teams. Today, we are learning about vowel teams with consonants. On Monday, we learned that a vowel team is when two letters go together to make one vowel sound. Sometimes consonant letters are used in vowel teams some examples are Y, G, H, and W. The letters A and Y can form a vowel team. In the vowel team A, Y, the A is long and the Y is silent. Knowing that A, Y makes the long sound A, how might you spell play? Yes, P, L. A Y. What about tray? Tray is spelled T R A Y. What about spray? That one has a three letter blend S P R A Y. The letters I and G H can form a vowel team. In the vowel team I G H, the I is long and the GH are silent. The word high starts with H and is followed by the vowel team IGH. How might you spell night? You got it, N-I-G-H-T. And finally, what about flight? Yes, flight is spelled F-L-I-G-H-T. The letters O and W can form a vowel team as well. In the vowel team O-W, the O is long and the W is silent. We have blow, grow, and snow. But what about cow? It has the O-W vowel team, but doesn't make the long O sound. The vowel team O makes two different sounds. It makes the sound O as in rainbow, and it makes us the sound ow as in take a bow. Just like all the vowel patterns we have learned about, 
Once you know a vowel pattern, you can use it to help you read and write new words. Hi, Arlington County. I'm Mrs. Cowden from Alice West Fleet Elementary. We're gonna read a, a poem together. It's called Blue and Yellow. I'm gonna read it first while you follow along. Blue and Yellow. Today I learned how a color is made. I learned how to mix up a lovely green shade. I discovered that yellow when added to blue turns into a pleasant, agreeable hue. At first I was baffled by what I would choose to add yellow paint to my small pots of blues. But then I remembered that grasses and beans and olives and turtles and hoses are green. I started by adding bits of yellow to blues. I was not sure exactly how much yellow to use. I was painting some grass in a small sunny park, but the green in my grass looked unusually dark. So I painted some beans, I painted a snake, I painted a fern by the side of a lake. Then I added more yellow and thought of the sun. I stirred and I stirred and when I was done, the green in the pot wasn't dark, it was light. Then I painted my grass and the shade was just right. So I guess I have learned it's important and true that green comes from yellow that is mixed up with blue. And now when I think that learning's a pain, I remember those colors that lit up my brain. Did you notice while I was reading that I stopped after the periods and paused for a minute? And after commas, I paused for a very short little bit and then kept reading. When we read together, make sure you stop for a minute at the periods and we're gonna pause for a little bit less than a period for the commas, just a little break. Let's try it together. You follow along, I'll have my cursor at the edge of the, the um, line that we're starting on. Blue and yellow. Today, I learned how a color is made. I learned how to mix up a lovely green shade. I discovered that yellow, when added to blue, turns into a pleasant, agreeable hue. At first I was baffled by why I would choose to add yellow paint to my small pots of blues. But then I remembered that grasses and beans and olives and turtles and hoses are green. I started by adding bits of yellow to blues. I was not sure exactly how much yellow to use. I was painting some grass in a small sunny park, but the green in my grass looked unusually dark. So I painted some beans. I painted a snake. I painted a fern by the side of a lake. Then I added more yellow and thought of the sun. I stirred and I stirred, and when I was done, the green in the pot wasn't dark, it was light. Then I painted my grass and the shade was just right. So I guess I have learned it's important and true that green comes from yellow that is mixed up with blue. And now when I think that learning's a pain, I remember those colors that lit up my brain. Were you able to follow along? Now that we've read the poem a couple of times, I wanna make sure we understand all of the words in this poem. One of the words that I wanna make sure that you understood was um, shade. Sometimes shade can get a little tricky because it can be used two different ways. So in this story, today I learned how a color is made. I learned how to mix up a lovely green shade. That is not the shade that we pull down on the window because that doesn't make sense. It is not the shade outside that sometimes the sun makes when it has a tree and there might be shade. This is actually a lighter or darker color of green. So shade in this instance means 
a lighter or darker color of green. Let's see if that makes sense. Today, I learned how a color is made. I learned how to mix up a lovely green shade. That makes sense because it wouldn't be a shade that you pull down over your window. I discovered that yellow when added to blue turns into a pleasant, agreeable hue. What is a hue? Well, if I go back and I think about my story, it says here, I discovered that yellow when added to blue turns into a pleasant, agreeable, it turns into another color when I add yellow and blue. So hue must be a color, must mean color. Because I know, because I did it in art class, when I add yellow and blue, it makes green. And so they are talking about a new color that they made, a new hue. At first, I was baffled by why I would choose. Baffled? Hmm, I've seen baffled before, but I'm not sure what it means in this. Let me see if I go a little further, if I can figure out baffled. At first, I was baffled by what I would by why I would choose to add yellow paint to my small pots of blues. I think it's he's questioning it. He's kind of puzzled. Why would I do that? He's kind of questioning himself or herself. But then I remembered that grasses and beans and olives and turtles and hoses are green. That all makes sense. And then if I go back here, I started adding bits of blues, bits of yellow to blues. I was not exact sure exactly how much yellow to use. I was painting some grass in a small sunny park, but the green in my grass looked unusually dark. So that shade, right? The dark, the green was too dark of a shade of green. So I painted some beans, things that could be darker. I painted a snake. I painted a fern by the side of a lake. And I'm wondering if this fern, the, the author gave us a little help with a fern right there, didn't they? That's the fern is a type of plant and ferns can be a darker shade of green. I painted a fern by the side of a lake. Then I added more yellow and thought of the sun. I stirred and I stirred and when I was done, the green in the pot wasn't dark, it was light. Then I painted my grass and the shade was just right. So it wasn't too dark, it was just right, a little lighter. So I guess I have learned it's important and true that green comes from yellow that is mixed up with blue. And now when I think that learning's a pain, I remember those colors that lit up my brain. Now that we've read blue and yellow a couple of times, and we've talked about some of the vocabulary, we're going to look at each um, set of um, lines and see if we can figure out what the author is talking about or the po um, poet. To blue and yellow. Today I learned how a color is made. I learned how to mix up a lovely green shade. I discovered that yellow, when added to blue, turns into a pleasant, agreeable hue. So it sounds like he's, he or she is excited that they learned something new today. And they learned that when you mix yellow and blue, it turns into green. And now I'm starting to realize that when I was in art class, I have done that before where I have mixed yellow and blue and it turns into green. At first, I was baffled by why I would choose to add yellow paint to my small pot of blues. But then I remembered that grasses and beans and olives and turtles and hoses are green. So he's starting to think of what else he could color that would also be green. And all of those things that he just talked about or she just talked about are green. Grasses and beans are green and olives and turtles and hoses are all green. I started by adding bits of yellow to blues. I was not sure exactly how much yellow to use. 
I was painting some grass in a small sunny park, but the green in my grass looked unusually dark. So this person in this poem had not added a lot of yellow to the blue and it was a very dark green. And so he felt like he could paint the beans and a snake and a fern, all these darker greens, but he had to add more yellow. Cause here's where it says, then I added more yellow and thought of the sun. I stirred and I stirred and when I was done, the green in the pot wasn't dark, it was light. So he had made enough yellow or added enough yellow to his blue that made a lighter shade of green. And he thought that that would be a perfect color for the grass. And then at the very bottom, he says, so I guess I have learned it's important and true that green comes from yellow that is mixed up with blue. So he feels like, wow, that's a big thing I just learned, that green actually is from a blue and yellow mixed. And now when I think that learning's a pain, I remember those colors that lit up my brain. So he was really excited. Sometimes when learning might be hard, he's gonna try to remember back when this green was made by yellow and blue and how exciting he was on that. So if reading or writing or math or science or any other subject gets a little tricky, he's gonna try to remember back to when he learned that yellow and blue make green and how excited he was for that. I hope you enjoyed our poem, Blue and Yellow. And maybe if you have time, you can ask your mom or dad if you can make blue or yellow mix blue and yellow. So you can mix paint or food coloring, but make sure you have mom and dad's permission because it can get pretty messy. Hi students, Mr. Parker here. And today we are going to be reading a fiction story together called A Golden Tragedy. Remember that fiction means make-believe or not real. And this story is actually based on a Greek myth, which was told long, long ago and has been told many, many times since then. In this story, a character makes a wish. Do you do that? What do you wish for? Well, this character's wish comes true, but it doesn't work out exactly the way that he hoped it would. As we read this story together today, our focus is going to be on identifying the conflict and the resolution. The conflict of a story is the problem or what's going wrong. Sometimes that conflict can be internal on the inside of a character. Maybe it's feelings or fears or doubts that the character is having. Sometimes that conflict or problem can be external, which means it's coming in from the outside. Maybe it's an enemy, or sometimes even nature can cause an external conflict for a character. The resolution then is how that conflict or problem gets solved or fixed, or how things wrap up for the character at the end of the story. So as we read A Golden Tragedy, I want you to listen and think about what the conflict could be. What's going wrong? And then also, what is the resolution? How do things get fixed? I hope you enjoy the story. All right, here we go. A Golden Tragedy, an ancient Greek myth retold by Robin King, illustrated by Joel Snyder. Don't forget, friends, we're looking to identify the conflict or the problem, what's going wrong, and also the resolution, how it gets solved or fixed. A Golden Tragedy Long, long ago, in a far-off land, there lived a very wealthy and kind king. King Midas had everything anyone could hope for. He had immense wealth a peaceful kingdom, and a beautiful daughter whom he loved dearly. Yet, despite his good fortune, the king had one weakness. He wanted more. Most of all, he wanted to please his devoted daughter, Penelope. Penelope cared for the plumpest, most beautiful birds in all the land. She left little doubt that she liked feathered creatures, such as chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese, best of all the animals on earth. 
Their feathers glistened in the bright sunshine, and the cluckers, gobblers, quackers, and honkers clucked, gobbled, quacked, and honked musical notes with golden tones. Every day but Tuesday, each bird laid three eggs that seemed bigger than melons. But that was not good enough for Penelope. She wanted her fowl to lay golden eggs too. Since the king never wanted to disappoint his daughter, he set off to visit a wise wizard to enlist his help. King Midas asked the wizard for one wish. And what is your wish? The wizard asked. Without thinking of the consequences, which was his usual way, King Midas stated, I would like the power to turn anything I touch into gold. The wizard, bewildered by the request, said, But you are already the wealthiest man in any kingdom. What could you possibly do with more gold? King Midas simply said, It is more important that I keep my daughter happy. Someday you will regret this, the wizard warned before casting the spell. The king fixed his thoughts on delighting his daughter. He didn't even bother to inquire why the wizard thought he would later regret his wish. This would prove to be a tragic mistake. Why do you think King Midas might regret his wish? Do you see a conflict coming or a big problem? The king traveled the road back to the palace, testing his new power. His path became littered with golden rocks and bordered by glistening flowers and trees with leaves of gold. The king saw only the golden hue of everything around him. He failed to notice that his kingdom turned stiff and still in his wake. Excited, he entered the palace and ordered the chef to prepare a feast. From there, he walked to the royal barnyard. He went from nest to nest, turning each egg to gold. The royal dinner bell rang, calling the king to his feast. He sat down, and instantly his chair became a golden throne. When he picked up his fork, it too turned to gold, along with his bite of roasted pheasant. He picked up his goblet, and presto, it changed from silver to gold. As the liquid inside touched his lips, it became solid gold. Do you think there would be a problem with your food or what you drink turning to gold when it touched your mouth? What is this? exclaimed the king. What have I done? Whatever shall I drink or eat? Just then Penelope came running into the room, dancing about in great excitement. Father, father, she shouted with glee. Look what I found in the barnyard nests golden eggs. She threw her arms around her father's neck and gave him a huge hug. Uh-oh, I think there could be a problem with that. As one might expect, a tragedy occurred. Penelope froze in her loving embrace, stiff as a statue. Oh my, what have I done? King Midas cried. My daughter will never speak loving words to me again. She will never wrap her soft arms around me. Whatever will I do? King Midas worked himself into a frenzied panic. He paced in circles. He dithered and fretted. Then it struck him. He had to return to the wizard and ask for another wish. Hurriedly, the king mounted his horse, but before it took two steps, it hardened into gold. The troubled king marched double time to the wizard's cottage on the edge of his kingdom. When he arrived, he rushed to the door and rapped furiously. Let me in! Let me in! His voice quivered and quaked. The wizard magically opened his now golden door and King Midas bolted in. You must grant me another wish, the king demanded. I've made a terrible mistake. Please, he begged, turn all that I have touched back to what it was. The only way I can do that is to take away all the gold and glitter that surrounds you, warned the wizard. 
even that which you had before this greedy golden touch overtook you, only then can the spell be reversed. Do you understand? Do what you must, but do it quickly, urged the king wildly. With a flick of his wrist, the wizard removed the power that had become the king's curse. King Midas's clothes became drab and common. His palace shrank into a humble house. The king lost all that made him wealthy, but gained something far more precious. His daughter, he learned that there was much more to life than glitter and gold. I hope you enjoyed that story, friends. Now, think about what the conflict was for King Midas. What was his problem? What went wrong? And what was the resolution? How did things wrap up in the end? Did the problem get solved? All right, now let's see how we do identifying conflict and resolution in a golden tragedy. Here's a little quiz for you. What is the conflict for King Midas in the story? A, he loves his daughter Penelope very much. B, he meets a wizard. C, everything and everyone he touches turn to lifeless gold. Hmm, what was the conflict? Yes, C, everything and everyone he touches turn to lifeless gold. This is a big problem for King Midas. He can't eat or drink and he lost his daughter the one he loves most. What is the resolution for King Midas in the story? A. Penelope loves the golden eggs. B. King Midas gives up his wealth to get his daughter back. C. King Midas is greedy and he always wants more. Hmm. What was the resolution? Yes, B, King Midas gives up his wealth to get his daughter back. That's how things get solved. The golden touch is gone. And even though King Midas isn't rich anymore, he knows what is most important to him now. Good job. Thanks for learning with me today about conflict and resolution. Think back to some of your favorite stories. Can you identify the conflicts and resolutions in them? Do you think a story could have more than one conflict and or resolution? Can you think of some examples? Stay golden and see you next time. Hi everyone, my name is Ms. Berg and I teach second and third grade at Campbell Elementary. Today's lesson for math is all about polygons. I want you to get your voice ready because there is a lot of important vocabulary and words that we're going to talk about today to help us name 2D shapes with lots of sides. So get yourself ready. Let's start today's lesson with an activity called how many shapes, how many sides. So I'm going to flash pictures on the screen. So you have to watch carefully. You might see some squares, circles, rectangles, or triangles, and there might be one, two, three, or more of them. And your job is to figure out how many shapes and how many sides there are. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's the first one, get ready. How many shapes did you see? And what shapes did you see? And how many sides did you see? Well, on this card, there were two shapes. They were both triangles. So if we talk about sides, it's three on each triangle. Three plus three equals six sides. Here's another one, get ready. How many shapes did you see? And what shapes did you see? And how many sides did you see? Here it is. There were two shapes, one square and one circle. So how many sides? 
4 on the square and 0 on the circle equals 4 sides total. Here we go, get ready. How many shapes did you see and what shapes did you see? And how many sides did you see? Let's check it out. There were three shapes, two rectangles and one triangle. So if each rectangle has four sides and the triangle has three sides, four plus four plus three equals 11 sides. Our learning target for today is I can name and describe different types of polygons. And of course, the most important word here is polygons. Let's explore that word first. We'll play a game called Guess My Rule. You're going to guess my rule to find out what a polygon is. If it fits my rule, I will put it in the circle. If it does not fit my rule, I will put it outside the circle. Here we go. This shape is not a polygon. That's why it's outside the circle. But this one, the rectangle, is a polygon, so I put it in there. Here's another polygon. That fits my rule. But this shape, a circle, does not fit my rule. Ooh, a cube. It also doesn't fit my rule. But a rhombus does. This weird shape, that does not fit my rule. But this triangle does fit my rule. Take a minute to think about what you notice here and guess what my rule is for polygons. Here we go. What is a polygon? Well, the first thing about polygons is that they are two dimensional. They are plane figures like we talked about last week. So a rectangle is a polygon, but a cube is not a polygon because it's 3D. Polygons are closed figures. That means that they don't have any openings. This hexagon is a polygon, but this thing has an opening in it. It's not a polygon. And the last rule for polygons is that they have three or more straight sides that don't cross. So a triangle is a polygon, but a circle isn't because its sides are not straight. Now, there are lots of types of polygons. We're gonna learn the names of some of them, but just know that we're gonna stop at 10 sides because we could just go on and on. So we're gonna learn the names of just the ones up to 10 sides. A three-sided polygon, I bet you know already, it's a triangle. A four-sided figure, we're going to call it a quadrilateral. Say that word for me, quadrilateral. And I know you might be thinking, Miss Burke, that shape is a rectangle. And you're right, a rectangle is just one type of quadrilateral. There are a bunch of other quadrilaterals too. A square is a quadrilateral, and so is a rhombus. Squares and rhombuses are special because they have all four sides equal. A trapezoid is a special kind of quadrilateral with only one pair of parallel sides. And a parallelogram is a word for quadrilaterals that have two sets of parallel sides. And of course, rectangles, squares, and rhombuses are also parallelograms. It's a little bit complicated, all these names of quadrilaterals. So that's why we're just gonna use the word quadrilateral today and get ready to be naming the different kinds later on. The five-sided figure, the five-sided polygon is called a pentagon say pentagon. There's an important building in our town, Arlington, called the Pentagon, and it is shaped like a pentagon. It has five sides. A six-sided polygon is called a hexagon, say hexagon. You've probably seen them in pattern block sets. A seven-sided figure, though, is called a heptagon, and that might be a new word, so let's say it together. Heptagon. 
and an eight-sided figure is called an octagon, just like a stop sign. Say octagon. A nine-sided figure is called a nonagon. Say that for me, nonagon. And a ten-sided figure is called a decagon. Say decagon. Great. Now all of these polygons can be regular or irregular polygons. On a regular polygon, all the sides are congruent or the same, and all the angles are congruent. So the square is a regular quadrilateral. It has four equal sides and four equal angles. This triangle is a regular triangle. All three sides are the same, all three angles are the same. And this hexagon is a regular hexagon. Again, all the sides are the same, all the angles are the same. In an irregular polygon, all the sides are not congruent and all the angles are not congruent either. So here's a pentagon. It has five sides, but they are not all the same. This one is actually a nonagon. It has nine sides, but some are long and some are short and the angles are all kinds of different. And this triangle has three different length sides and three different sized angles. So it's an irregular triangle. Let's put all those words together and try to name these polygons. First, we'll ask ourselves, are all the sides and angles the same? On this polygon, they're not. So we call it an irregular polygon. And then we have to count up the sides. Let me give you a tip. If it has a lot of sides, you might want to keep track somehow. I'm going to mark them on the screen as you count how many sides there are. Ready? So how many sides are there? That's right, there are six sides. And we call a six-sided shape a hexagon. You got it. So this polygon is an irregular hexagon. Here's another one. Our first question is, are all the sides and angles the same? They are. So this one is a regular polygon. And now we have to count up the sides. You count while I keep track. How many sides were there? That's right, there were nine sides. And so we call this shape a nonagon. Good job, this one is a regular nonagon. Here's another one. Are all the sides and angles the same? They're not, you're right. So it's an irregular polygon. And how many sides are there? I bet you can count them without me marking them. That's right, there are four sides. So we call this a quadrilateral. You've got it, this is an irregular quadrilateral. How about this one? Can you name this polygon? Are all the sides and angles the same? Mm, I don't think so. And how about how many sides are there? It looks to me like there are eight. So is this an octagon? Oh, that's right. This is breaking one of the rules. Do you remember which one? Yep, this is not a polygon because it has some curved sides and polygons have to have straight sides. How about some pictures from my walk? I saw this window. Can you name this polygon? First, ask yourself, are all the sides and angles the same? They are. It's a regular polygon. And how many sides are there? Count along while I mark them. Mm, there are eight of them, good job. What do we call an eight-sided figure? 
That's right, it's an octagon. This window is a regular octagon. Ooh, I saw this sign, and it has two polygons on it. One is the part with the person walking on it, and the other one is the part with the arrow on it. So are all the sides and angles the same? Well, they are on the top figure, with the one with the person walking, but they're not on the bottom one. The sides are different lengths. Now let's think about how many sides these two figures have. That's right, they both have four sides. So what do we call four-sided figures? That big fancy word, quadrilateral. You got it. So these are both quadrilaterals. The one on the top is a regular quadrilateral. And in, in this case, it's a square. The one on the bottom is an irregular quadrilateral. And in this shape, it's a rectangle. So our learning target for this lesson was I can name and describe different types of polygons. Go ahead for a second to hold up your hand and rate yourself from fist to five. Are you feeling like, no, I can't name and describe different polygons at all? You're starting to, you're getting the idea if you hold up three fingers, and if you hold them all up, you're feeling really good about naming and describing polygons. Today, when you reflect on this lesson, talk with someone in your house about where you see polygons in your home or your neighborhood. Talk with them about how many sides the polygons you see have and what they are called. I bet you'll find lots of polygons around your house and neighborhood. Today, our family math tip is all about getting outside and practicing combining and subdividing polygons. So, I know you're probably thinking that sounds very complicated, but actually, it's a really straightforward thing. What I want you to do is, if you have some chalk, go ahead and go outside, and you're going to work on combining two polygons and figure out what new polygon they form. So for example, I made a triangle first, and then I put a rectangle underneath it. And the new polygon that was formed had five sides. It was a pentagon. In the same way, we can also talk about subdividing polygons. And that's when we draw a polygon, and then we draw a line through it, and see what two new polygons have formed. So, I drew some rectangles. The first rectangle, I drew a diagonal line through. And so, when I divided that rectangle, I came up with two triangles. But the second rectangle, I drew a line straight down the middle. And I wound up with two new rectangles. So that's what subdividing polygons is all about. Drawing one, drawing a line through it, and then deciding what new shape is formed. So I hope you have some fun exploring polygons outside if you don't have chalk, you could always do this on paper too, so that would be super fun with some markers. Just give it a try and let's see what polygons you come up with. My name is Erin Sam. I am a teacher and a mindfulness coach. And what that means is I help people just like you use all of their senses to notice moment to moment what's happening in their lives so they can worry a little bit less and smile a whole lot more. Today, I'm going to share with you a mindfulness exercise that will help you to listen to your self-talk and make sure that the voice in your mind is being really, really super nice to you. Are you ready? Good. We begin this exercise by coming into a comfortable position with our bodies. Remember, sometimes we need to move and wiggle and shake a little bit in order for us to find comfort and stillness. 
So once you're ready to settle your body, notice where you're connected to the earth, through your feet, through your bottom, maybe something pressing up against your back. And once your body is comfortable, start to notice your breath. Bring all of your attention to how the breath feels coming in and out of your body. And maybe your eyes are closed and if not, let the gaze Settle somewhere down below. And before we start to listen inside of our head, just notice any sounds that you can detect in the room. Maybe someone's voice, a clock ticking, the sound of a fan, Maybe you hear a bird outside. Use your concentration to hear those sounds. And then start to turn your attention to your mind listening to any thoughts that you may be holding in your own brain. Sometimes we talk to ourselves in our mind. And sometimes when we do that, we aren't always nice to ourselves. Sometimes we say mean things to ourselves because we're upset or we're sad or we don't like a choice that we made, or we're just having a difficult time, that is normal. Everyone goes through that, so you are not alone. But know that we can also change the voice inside our head so that our self-talk is really happy and positive and loving and encouraging. So I want you to bring to mind right now something nice that you can say to yourself. Maybe something nice about the way you do something. Maybe something nice about the way you've helped someone. Say something really friendly and loving to yourself. This is how we can encourage positive self-talk. And know that anytime you feel sad or you're afraid or you're worried about something, you can always come into this comfortable shape with your body and say something really nice to yourself. Thank you so much for practicing mindfulness with me today. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Second Step Lessons are created by Committee for Children, who owns and controls all rights therein. Permission was granted to District to make and broadcast this video for educational use only by District parents, families, teachers, and counselors with students currently learning via television broadcast due to the impact of COVID-19. No other use of this video or Second Step Lessons is permitted. Committee for Children, 2020. Hi everyone, I'm glad to see you again. Today we're going to talk about another skill for learning, one of my favorites actually, self-talk. 
Self-talk is when you talk to yourself in a quiet voice or in your head. And you can use it to help you with all kinds of challenges. Let's start with a brain builder to warm up our brains and practice using self-talk to remember. We're going to play a memory game. I'm going to say a number one time. Then you will use self-talk to remember the number. You can repeat the number quietly out loud or in your head. After five seconds, two different numbers will show up on the screen and you need to point to the correct number. Let's try it. Here's our first number for you to remember using self-talk. One, four, seven. One, four, seven. Nice job. Let's try another. Two, six, four, nine. Ding, ding, ding. Two, six, four, nine. All right, let's do another. Four, seven, one, five, seven. Good job, that was a long one. Four, seven, one, five, seven. Here's another. Three, five, six, three, one. Three, five, six, three, one. Good job, let's do one more. Nine, five, three, four, two. Nine, five, three, four, two. Great job, everyone. During that brain builder game, you used many different skills for learning. You had to focus your attention and listen when I said the number, and then you had to use self-talk to remember the number. That was a great exercise for building your brain. So today we're gonna talk about using self-talk to ignore distractions. Take a look at this picture. This is Omar. He's trying to work on his book report, but distractions are making it hard for him to stay focused. Focus your attention on the picture. What are the distractions? There's a girl sitting next to him talking. We can tell because her mouth is open and she's looking at Omar. And then you probably see in the background, there's two different groups of students talking. So I could imagine it's maybe loud in the classroom and that's making it hard for Omar to focus too. What are some things Omar could say to himself to help him focus and ignore those distractions? Maybe you're thinking he could read quietly to himself or in his head to block out the distractions. He can tell himself, stay focused, ignore them, concentrate Omar. Omar decides that he needs to give himself some reminders that he needs to focus and ignore the distractions. He also asks his table mate to let him focus and stop talking to him. Self-talk helps you ignore those distractions so you can stay focused and on task. Omar uses that self-talk to help himself ignore the distractions. So he's able to stay focused and get his book report done. One of my favorite ways to use self-talk is to remind myself that I can do something hard, to give myself that extra boost to believe in myself. This kind of positive self-talk helps me feel capable and confident. 
This is also a strategy used by some of the greatest athletes in the world. Have you ever heard of Lori Hernandez? She is one of the greatest gymnasts in the world. She's a member of the U.S. Women's Gymnastics Team and has won both gold and silver medals. And she uses self-talk. Lori practices for hours and hours, yet she still uses self-talk to remind herself that she can do it. So the next time that you are feeling like, I can't do it, Try to think of something positive to say to yourself. It might help to imagine what would my teacher say or what would my best friend or my parents say to me right now to cheer me up. As you challenge yourself to reach your summer school goal, there might be times when you don't think you can do it and you want to give up. This is the time to use self-talk. Say to yourself, my brain is getting stronger. I will try again. I won't give up. I can do this. Those positive self-talk statements will help your brain try again. Next week, we're going to talk about different ways that we can calm down strong emotions. So I'll talk to you then. Take care. Me llamo Diana Díaz y soy maestra en la Escuela de Inmersión Claremont. Hoy estaremos aprendiendo acerca de los polígonos y sus atributos. Pero antes de comenzar la lección, vamos a calentar nuestros pensamientos con la rutina de sentido numérico. ¡Empecemos! La pregunta para nuestro sentido numérico de hoy es ¿Cuál no pertenece? Observa cada una de las figuras y contesta la pregunta, ¿cuál de ellas no pertenece? Toda respuesta está correcta siempre y cuando puedes explicar tu pensamiento. Algunas de las palabras que puedes utilizar son cuadrado, hexágono, trapecio, rectángulo, lados, igual, ángulos, distinto, paralelos. ¿Cuál de las figuras no pertenece? ¿Ya pensaste en una? Aquí te doy un ejemplo. El hexágono no pertenece porque no tiene cuatro lados. Para poder entender una lección, es importante conocer el vocabulario. Te voy a mostrar algunas de las palabras que vamos a estar utilizando en nuestra lección. Figuras planas. Una figura plana es toda figura cerrada que tenga dos dimensiones. Largo y alto. Algunos ejemplos de figuras planas son los siguientes. Cuadrado. Rombo, rectángulo, trapecio, paralelogramo. Y esta figura que ves aquí tiene algo en común a todas las demás. ¿Qué será? Tiene cuatro lados. Toda figura cerrada con cuatro lados se conoce como cuadrilátero. Todas ellas pertenecen a un grupo de cuadriláteros. También tenemos triángulo. Un triángulo tiene tres lados. El hexágono. ¿Cuántos lados tiene el hexágono? Tiene seis lados. Pentágono. ¿Cuántos lados tiene un pentágono? Tiene cinco lados. Conociendo el vocabulario, ya estás listo para la lección. ¿Estás listo para aprender una nueva palabra hoy? Es una palabra grande y muy interesante. ¿Quieres saber cuál es? 
polígonos. Polígonos. Esta palabra está compuesta por dos palabras. El prefijo poli viene de la palabra muchos, mientras el sufijo gonos significa ángulos. Esto me hace pensar que los polígonos tienen muchos ángulos. Los polígonos son figuras planas y cerradas. No tienen curvas. Está compuesto por segmentos que se llaman lados. También tienen vértices. ¡Qué interesante los polígonos! ¿Cómo serán ellos? Ya conocemos que un polígono es una figura cerrada que tiene muchos ángulos, lados y vértices. Conozcamos un ejemplo de un polígono. Un polígono está formado por segmentos que se conocen como lados. Mientras cada segmento se va uniendo, va formando ángulos y vértices. Como sabemos que un polígono es una figura cerrada, hasta que no se cierra la figura, no es un polígono. ¿Qué figura plana hemos formado? Un cuadrado. Pero ¿sabías que los polígonos que tienen cuatro lados se llaman cuadriláteros? Es un cuadrilátero. ¿Y cuáles serían los atributos o características de este polígono? Tiene cuatro lados. Tiene cuatro ángulos. Y tiene cuatro vértices. Este es un ejemplo de un polígono de cuatro lados. Utilicemos el modelo de Freyer para practicar los polígonos. Comencemos con la definición. Un polígono es una figura geométrica plana y cerrada que se forma con tres o más segmentos llamados lados. ¿Cuáles son las características o atributos? Un polígono se distingue por el número de lados, ángulos y vértices. Ahora te voy a mostrar algunas figuras para que tú me ayudes a decidir si es un ejemplo o no es un ejemplo. Presta atención a la figura. Esta figura tiene lados, ángulos y tiene vértices. Pero puedo observar aquí que tiene una curva. No menciona que las curvas sea parte de los atributos de los polígonos. ¿Ser un ejemplo o no ser un ejemplo? No es un ejemplo. Muy bien. El círculo. Observa las características y los atributos de los polígonos. ¿El círculo será un ejemplo o no será un ejemplo? No es un ejemplo. Observemos el hexágono. Es una figura plana que tiene seis lados, ángulos y vértices. ¿Será un ejemplo o no será un ejemplo? Sí es un ejemplo. ¡Tenemos una estrella! ¡Qué muchos lados y ángulos y vértices tiene! Como la palabra polígonos. Poli de muchos y gonos de ángulos. ¿Será un ejemplo o no será un ejemplo? Sí es un ejemplo. ¡Muy bien! ¡Una luna! ¿Qué observas? ¿Será un ejemplo o no es un ejemplo? No es un ejemplo. ¡Excelente! Porque la luna tiene una curva. Vamos a observar la próxima figura. Una figura que tiene cinco lados, cinco ángulos y cinco vértices. 
¿Cómo se llama esta figura? Pentágono. Muy bien. ¿Será un ejemplo o no es un ejemplo? Sí es un ejemplo. Un paralelogramo. Tiene cuatro lados, así que es un cuadrilátero. ¿Será un ejemplo o no será un ejemplo? Sí es un ejemplo. ¡Excelente! ¡Muy bien! Esta figura es diferente a las demás. ¿Qué tiene diferente a las otras? Es una figura abierta. No está cerrada. ¿Será un ejemplo o no es un ejemplo? No es un ejemplo. ¡Excelente! ¿Qué tú crees de esta figura? ¿Ser un ejemplo o no es un ejemplo? No es un ejemplo. ¡Un triángulo! ¿Me puedes decir los atributos? Tiene tres lados, tres ángulos y tres vértices. Sí es un ejemplo. ¡Excelente! ¡Muy bien! Gracias por ayudarme. Ya clasificamos las figuras en cuáles eran polígonos y cuáles no. ¿Sabías que los polígonos los podemos clasificar de otra manera? Podemos clasificarlos por la cantidad de lados. Un polígono que tiene tres lados se llaman triángulos. Un polígono que tiene cuatro lados se llama cuadrilátero. Cuando tienen cinco lados, es un pentágono. Y si tiene seis lados, es un hexágono. Ahora quiero que tú me ayudes a clasificar estos polígonos. ¿Estás listo? ¡Sí! Muy bien, comencemos con este que está aquí. Este es un paralelogramo. ¿Qué tipo de polígono es? ¡Cuadrilátero! Muy bien, tiene cuatro lados. ¿Qué tipo de polígono será este? Triángulo. Un triángulo. ¿Cuántos lados tiene? Tres. ¿Qué tipo de polígono será este? Cuadrilátero. Cuadrilátero. Muy bien. ¿Y qué tipo de figura será esta? Hexágono. Un hexágono. ¿Cuántos lados tiene? Seis. Muy bien. ¿Y este? Hmm. Los polígonos son figuras cerradas y esta figura está abierta. No es un polígono. Muy bien, no es un polígono. ¿Y esta figura? Es un pentágono. ¿Cuántos lados tiene? Cinco. Tiene cinco lados. ¿Qué figura es esta? Triángulo. Un triángulo. ¿Y qué tipo de polígono es este? Cuadrilátero. Cuadrilátero, excelente. ¿Y este que está aquí? Cuadrilátero. Otro cuadrilátero, muy bien. ¿Y este? Hexágono. Un hexágono, muy bien. ¿Recuerdas el nombre de esta figura? Pentágono. Un pentágono. ¿Y qué figura será esta o qué tipo de polígono es? Hexágono. Un hexágono. ¿Cuántos lados tiene un hexágono? Seis. Muy bien. ¿Qué tipo de polígono es este? Triángulo. Muy bien. ¿Y qué tipo de polígono es este? Pentágono. Muy bien. Un pentágono. ¿Y qué te parece este? No es un polígono. ¿Por qué? Porque tiene una curva. ¡Excelente! Los polígonos no tienen curvas. ¿Y este? Un cuadrilátero. ¡Es un cuadrilátero! ¡Muy bien! ¡Excelente! ¿Y este último? ¡Hexágono! ¡Hexágono! Gracias por ayudarme a clasificar los polígonos. Ahora te toca a ti reflexionar en casa. Observa estas figuras. Explícale a un familiar cuál es 
¿Y cuál no es un polígono? ¿Por qué? ¿Cómo lo sabes? Algunas palabras que puedes utilizar para explicar tu pensamiento son hexágono, figura abierta, figura cerrada, curva, lados. Te voy a dar unos segundos para reflexionar. ¡Excelente! Padres, gracias por apoyar el aprendizaje de matemáticas en casa. Para continuar practicando te voy a dar algunas ideas. Podemos utilizar plastilina y palitos de dientes. Los palitos representan los lados del polígono, mientras una bolita de plastilina representaría el vértice. Una vez unamos los palitos, que serían los lados con sus vértices, tendremos un polígono, una figura cerrada con lados, ángulos y vértices. Aquí tengo otros ejemplos ya. Uno que representa el triángulo, pentágono y un cuadrilátero. También podemos utilizar un index card o un pedazo de papel y recortarlo para formar polígonos con diferentes lados. Ya esto es un polígono, es un cuadrilátero. Quiero en esta ocasión formar un paralelogramo que sería otro tipo de cuadrilátero. También podemos utilizar el modelo de Freyer utilizando una hoja de papel y regla para poder clasificar los polígonos por la cantidad de lados. Puedo clasificar mis polígonos como un cuadrilátero, tiene cuatro lados, tengo aquí un hexágono que tiene seis lados, seis ángulos y seis vértices. Aquí tenemos un pentágono con cinco lados y un triángulo. Aprovecha esta ocasión para que el estudiante te pueda explicar los atributos del polígono. Gracias nuevamente por acompañarme en Aprendiendo Matemáticas en Casa con APS. ¡Hasta la próxima!